Okay, lesson number eight, uh, Mark for Beginners, chapter 13 of Mark, uh, Final Teachings uh, is the uh, title of this lesson. Okay, so we've said, I just, I'm going to repeat it one more time here, Mark tells the story on three levels and we've looked at all three as we you know, have worked our way through the book very briefly. Uh, Jesus' ministry to the masses, Jesus' ministry to His disciples on a more private basis, and of course the ongoing confrontation with various Jewish leaders, and Mark is kind of weaving these three storylines into one as we go through his gospel. So with uh, Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, declaring openly His true identity to the masses, followed by His final confrontation and rebuke of the leaders, talked about that in our last lesson, there remains just one final time with the disciples uh, for ministry. Uh, so during this time, Jesus is going to teach them about three things. First of all, the judgment on Israel for having rejected their Messiah. Secondly, uh, He's going to talk about the, uh, what, what is going to happen to Him in the, uh, uh, in the near future, and then how they will uh, commemorate His life and death and resurrection. So those are the things that he's going to uh, talk about uh, with them that we're going to look at tonight. So final time, ministering to the disciples will then be followed by a description of his suffering and death and resurrection, uh, which we will do in our last lesson. Last lesson is next week. Okay, so when you read chapter 13 of Mark, you're not sure what Jesus is talking about. Uh, is he talking about the final end of the world or is he talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, which occurred in 70 AD? Um, now, in Matthew 24 and Matthew 24 and 5, anybody who's in that class that I teach, um, you will know that in Matthew 24, 25, Jesus talks about you know, the whole panorama of history, you know, from the time, uh, the present time in his life while he's talking to the disciples, all the way to the end of the world. So he talks about that. And then in another part of Matthew 24, he talks about, he zeroes in on the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, and he talks about that for a while. Uh, and then he, 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 he talks about the end of the world, the actual end of the world, the second coming, he talks about that for a while. All that is included in Matthew 24 and 25, so you have to kind of know, you know when he leaves off one topic and he goes to another. In Mark chapter eight, however, he doesn't do that. He focuses on only one event. And that's the thing you have to remember between Matthew 24 and Mark 8. Yes, he's talking about a cataclysmic event, but in Matthew 24, he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the world. Mark 8, just the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay, so let's do one and two. So as he was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, behold, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another which will not be torn down. So the apostles, you know, remember he's already had confrontation in Jerusalem, so on and so forth. They're leaving the city now, leaving the temple. And they're referring to a structure that uh, was in a period of restoration for over 40 years, 40 years of construction work on this temple that they had witnessed most of their lives. So he tells them that the temple is going to be destroyed. Now you have to remember the temple represented and embodied the Jewish religion and the Jewish nation. It wasn't just some building that was going to get knocked down. I mean, are you kidding me? If, if the temple goes, in their mind, everything goes, all right? So they don't understand yet that Christianity will supersede Judaism, and the total destruction of the temple and the city will be a sign of this fact that, that Christianity now breaks free. Because for a long time, for several decades, Christianity was simply seen as an outshoot of Judaism. Uh, not just by the Jews, but by, other, by the Romans, by the Gentiles. They saw Christianity as just another kind of facet of, of Judaism, but with the destruction of, 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 of the temple and the city and so on and so forth, Christianity began to be seen by others as a, as a religion that stood on its own. Okay? So verse three and four, 
It says, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew were questioning him privately. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? So several of the apostles were disturbed about this idea, so they questioned him specifically about it. They want to know, when is this going to happen? And what are going to be the signs that it's going to happen? So the response that Jesus gives in the next verses is an answer to these two questions. So the first four verses in, in, in Mark chapter eight establish the context for everything. They want to know, when's the temple going to be destroyed? Right, that's the question. And are there any signs? He answers that question, okay. So a confusing thing for us who read Jesus' answer is that he uses apocalyptic language, same language that's in the Revelation, same kind of language is in the book of Daniel, so on and so forth. Um, it's called ap uh, apocalyptic language. Uh, and they used it um, the, so that only Jews understood. You had to understand the symbolism, you know what I'm saying, in order to understand the, uh, the message. So only those who knew Jesus uh, and both the question and answer will be able to uh, discern the meaning of what he says in the next verses. But remember, however, that he's talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. Just, if you just keep that in mind, you know, this will make perfect sense, okay? So they asked him, remember, what are going to be the signs? How will we know this is going to happen? So Jesus mentioned several phases leading up to this event. I'm not going to read all the verses, but I'll give you the phases, okay? So phase number one, um, the false rumor stage, or let's call them stages. Uh, the false rumor stage, verses five to eight. So Jesus tells them after him, there'll be a lot of false prophets that will arise and preach that the end of the world is coming. One of the historical writers of the time, Josephus, writes about these people and how they were killed or executed or they faded away. The Jews were always at odds with Herod and Rome and there were always many rumblings, you know, political and military rumblings going on all the time. So Jesus warns them not to be panicked by these things. So there'll be the false rumor stage. Next, there'll be the persecution stage, talks about uh, that in verses six to 13. Uh, now we know that soon after Pentecost and the preaching of the gospel, what happens? Well, the apostles were imprisoned by the Jewish authorities in Acts chapter four. And then later on, Paul and his associates were persecuted by both the Jews and the Romans, Acts 17 and 23 and 26. And, uh, and we know that, we know anyways, that Paul and, and, and Peter were martyred in Rome uh, as a general persecution of Christianity was begun throughout the empire. Uh, so we know that. Uh, even these terrible events were not the judgment that he's talking about. So they, remember, they're saying, what are the signs? And he's saying, well, don't worry about the rumors and the military upheaval, that's not a sign. Don't worry about the fact that you people will be persecuted, because that's not a sign. You'll be persecuted, but that's not a sign of what I'm talking about. Next stage, the siege stage, verses 14 to 23. So Jesus gives them the sign that destruction is near. He says, but I will give you one sign. When you see Jerusalem under siege, okay, pay attention. The end is coming once you see them under siege. Now we know that Luke chapter 21, verse 20 says that the surrounding of Jerusalem by the Roman army with their idolatrous shields uh, was a desecration of the temple, considered a desecration of the temple. And when they did that, that was the fulfillment of what Jesus is talking about here. When you see the temple desecrated, under siege, know that the end is near. Now, Jerusalem was under siege, not just for a day or two, it was under siege for four years, okay? They did things kind of slow in those days. They, they didn't just charge in you know, and try to bust in. It was a million people in the city or more. And they also had an army. 
So what did the Romans do? We'll starve them out. What do we care? I mean, we have, we have you know, enough soldiers. They just you know, marched the army up where no one could leave, no one could come in, and they just waited. They waited till the, the inhabitants of the city starved. They waited, they waited, they waited. Okay. At some point, they began to close in. At some point, their uh, you know, companies surrounded the city. The shields went up. You know, their, uh, there's another word for that and I can't think of. The, their banners went up. And on these banners, they had idolatrous uh, images uh, which many of the soldiers would worship. And so this here was a desecration of the holy ground of the temple. And Jesus is saying, when you see that happen, boy, you know there's a sign that the end uh, is near. So Jesus warns them that when the news that the temple has been desecrated comes, it'll be time to flee the city. Now history records that the Christian community that lived in Jerusalem did escape the city to go to a city called Pella, which was across the Jordan River. Uh, and they were able to do this during a lull in the siege when the Roman army pulled back for a short time because there's politics going on in Rome and they've got other wars going on, they've got other campaigns going on and they need this company and that company. So for a time they pulled back. The Jews in the city are thinking, hey, we're good. <laughs> and Jesus said, no, 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 no. You know, when you see that happen, get out. And so historically we know that the majority of the Christian community in Jerusalem escaped during that time. And then the Roman army came back at this time with a vengeance, okay? So as I say, um, uh, the siege lasted over four years from 66 to a little past 70 AD. And when they had starved out the inhabitants, they charged in, massacred everybody in the worst bloodbath in history up until that time, million people estimate. Jesus says, however, that he shortened those days because of the elect okay, who managed to have at least a remnant survive the ordeal, shortened in the sense that he permitted some to survive. The Romans didn't kill everybody, almost everybody, but there was a little remnant uh, that, was, that was left. And so he warns them that these things are going to happen and they know when to escape. I've given you the sign. Then there's the gospel stage, verse 24 to 27. So in apocalyptic language, which is a literary style used to describe terrible wars or national tragedies or the judgment of God on a nation and apocalyptic literature, apocalyptic style, you know, the moon is filled with blood and the stars fall and the dragon with a chain, you know, that's all apocalyptic style uh, language. So Jesus uses apocalyptic style language to describe what? The fall of a nation, the end of an era, it's a pretty amazing thing. The people of God are going to be wiped off the, the face of the earth here. And so uh, it means that an era has ended and a new one begins. So Jesus is telling them that with the destruction of the city and the temple, an era and a nation has ended. The time when the Jews where God's chosen people will now end with this destruction. There's still people who are dear to His heart because they're the first ones to have the promises. Through them the prophets came, the law was given, the Savior you know, was born. So he, he loves those people, but they themselves culturally, based on their culture, are no longer the elect. Okay? That has changed. Uh, in this passage it also talks about the Son of Man, when the Son of Man comes. This is uh, Old Testament imagery, um, Isaiah 19.1, and it describes God's visitation upon a nation for the purpose of judgment. So God visited the Assyrians, He visited the Babylonians, the Medes, the Greeks, and now He visited the Jews, for what? for the purpose of judgment. So when the Son of Man comes or when the God does the visitation, it's easy to think, oh, this means the end of the world. Well, it could mean the end of the world, but it could also mean the end of a certain nation, the end of a certain empire, the end of a certain rule, okay? All right. Um, so uh, John, of course, um, uh, John the Apostle in the book of Revelation, using apocalyptic literature, he's going to describe how God will visit who? 
the Romans and their empire to destroy them. So that idea of the, the, the coming of the Lord is used quite often in the context of judgment. Okay, so next he's going to describe the new gospel age where the angels could be, the word could be, the Greek word could be translated as angels, but it can just as well be translated as messengers or apostles. Same, same word used uh, everywhere. Uh, will go out to every people to bring people, his elect, because the Jews are no longer his elect, to bring people into the kingdom. And so the farthest ends of heaven may refer to the martyrs who are part of the kingdom. There's a term in there. So you got the false rumor stage, the persecution stage, the siege stage, the gospel stage, and then the final warning stage, verses 28 to 37. So he's warned them, he's given them specifics, and he's assured them of several things in this long passage. One, that it's all going to happen in their generation. So this is not a description of the end of the world, this is a description of the end of Jerusalem, because many of them were alive when Jerusalem was, uh, was destroyed, okay, number one. Number two, nothing can stop it. There won't be a new prophet, no time for repentance, that time's all gone. Number three, no one but he knows when this is going to happen. Don't even try to speculate on the time, just be ready and look for the sign, again. For the sign of what? The sign for the end of Jerusalem, which is going to happen in your lifetime, he says. All right, so that's uh, Mark uh, 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 recording the answer to the apostles' question, when is the temple going to be destroyed? In Matthew, they ask him two questions. When is the temple going to be destroyed? And when are you coming back? Well, that's two different things. One of the problems with the apostles, John the Baptist, is they assumed that the end of the temple in Jerusalem would also be the end of the world because they couldn't imagine a world without the temple. Are you kidding me? There is no world if, if there's no temple. So they, they were mistaken about that. All right. So now uh, Mark moves on to chapter 14 to talk about the Passover meal. All right. So of course Jesus is a Jew as we know, and as a Jew, he observes the Passover. Uh, I'm not going to read uh, you know, a lot of material. I think in this class, everybody's pretty familiar with that. But for recording purposes, we know that the Passover commemorated the time when the angel of death destroyed every firstborn in Egypt, but spared the Jews who were in captivity there. The angel of death passed over right, their dwellings. Uh, they were spared because they obeyed God's instruction to sprinkle the blood of a lamb on their doorposts, right? And uh, to remain in their homes to partake of a special meal. Since that time each year the Jews would offer sacrifice of a lamb and share a special ritual meal in order to commemorate their freedom from Egyptian slavery. And this was usually in the spring. Uh, it was at this time of year that Jesus cleansed the temple and after teaching His disciples he was getting ready to do the Passover with them. Normally the father or the head of the household or the teacher would be the one who would preside over this special meal. It's one of the reasons we use that term. Who's presiding at the Lord's Supper? You know, today, who's presiding? Are you pre you know, which, which brother is going to preside over the meal? It comes from this idea, the father, the Jewish idea. The father, the teacher presided over the Passover meal, because it was a ritualistic meal. Okay? So as the scene opens in chapter 14, Jesus is with His disciples two days before Passover, um, and, and He's visiting Simon the leper. So this we'll read. So now the Passover and unleavened bread were two days away, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to seize Him by stealth and kill Him. For they were saying, not during the festival, otherwise there might be a riot of the people. So Mark notes that he was in danger, but his attackers would leave him alone during the Passover for fear of the people. I mean, I mean the, the hypocrisy is almost blinding here. You know, let's, <laughs> you know, we want to kill this guy. He hasn't done anything wrong, but we want to kill him, right? But we better not because we, you know, we, we want to observe our religious feast. You know, I mean, 
Anyways, it's just, it's amazing, okay. And so we move on, verse three, it says, so while he was in Bethany at the home of Simon the leper and reclining at the table, there came a woman with an alabaster vial of very costly perfume of pure nard. And she broke the vial and poured it over his head. But some were, indignant, uh, some were indignant, indignantly remarking to one another, why has this perfume been wasted? For this perfume might have been sold for over 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they were scolding her. But Jesus said, let her alone. Why do you bother her? She has done a good deed to me. For you always have the poor with you and whenever you wish you can do good to them. But you do not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for the burial. Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be spoken in memory of her. So Mark tells the story of the woman who anoints him with costly oil. A lot of them complain this was a waste. Of course, especially Judas, who saw a lost opportunity to sell the perfume himself and pocket the money. Uh, Jesus puts her action into context saying that it wasn't just a waste of oil you know, poured on his head to make him smell good. It, it wasn't aftershave, you know what I'm saying? She was in reality anointing his body in preparation for his death. Now the custom of course was to cover the dead body with perfumed oil to, to cover the, the smell and, and, and out of respect the Jews did not do embalming. They simply cleaned the body and they perfumed it and then they put it into the, into the tomb. Of course, uh, the difference was that the anointing here was done before he died. Because you didn't anoint before you died. You know, even if you were sick, they didn't anoint you. They put a little oil on you, you know, but they wouldn't anoint your whole body. You had to die first. So here the anointing is done as an act of, of prophecy. It's a, it's a living prophecy. Okay? Um, so Jesus commends the woman's act and uses it to advise his disciples of his death, which was to happen very soon. Remember, right? Remember the three strands? He's teaching the masses, teaching the disciples. He's teaching the disciples here. Verse 12, uh, I'll just jump to verse 12 here. It says, on the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare you, uh, for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water, follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room in which I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Uh, and he himself will show you a large upper room furnished and ready, prepare for us there. The disciples went out and came to the city and found it just as he had told them and they prepared the Passover. Uh, some ask, you know, how would they know which guy, you know, everybody's carrying water. How, it's like you know, uh, when you see a guy drive by in a car, stop him. You know. Well, it's because in those days, the men never carried the water. It was the women who carried the water. So a man carrying the water would be actually quite unusual. So he would be easy to spot. That's uh, that little thing there. But anyway, the Passover had grown into a week-long celebration by that time. Um, and it began with the eating of the sacrificial Paschal or Passover lamb. This particular year the Passover fell on a Thursday. So the two apostles are sent into the city to purchase and sacrifice a lamb at the temple, that's what they had to do first, and then make ready the room where they will eat that lamb, that meat, and the rest of the, uh, uh, rest of the food. Now no name is given to the owner of the room or its location in order to maintain security. Jesus knew of Judas' intention, so he's not going to mention the guy's name out loud and where they're going to be, because he doesn't want Judas you know, to bring anybody to that particular location. He has special plans there. Verse 17, when it was evening, he came with the twelve as they were reclining at the table and eating. Jesus said, truly I say to you that one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be grieved and say to him one by one, surely not I. And he said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who dips with me in the bowl. For the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. So Judas was with them at the meal when Jesus announces that there's a traitor uh, among them. Um, you know, for all the people who speculate about what happened to Judas, did he, you know, was he really lost, was he really saved, you know, 
Note what Jesus says about the one who betrays him. I mean, what other conclusion can you come to when Jesus says, woe to the one who betrays the Son of Man, you know? I mean, there's only one conclusion. Verse 22, let's keep going. Uh, while they were eating, he took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to them and said, take, take it, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will never again drink the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And after singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. So the normal Passover meal was a ritual where you know, the leader ate the meat and uh, the bitter herbs. You know, it was a kind of a, a salad with a certain type of bitterness. Uh, and this here it, um, uh, represented the bitterness and the difficulty, the bitter herbs represented the difficulty and bitterness of life in Egypt and slavery. Uh, we know that the unleavened bread that they were eating uh, represented their, their haste, their hurry to leave so they wouldn't take the time to cook the bread, okay, or bake the bread. And the wine wasn't part of the original Passover meal. They didn't have wine when they were in Egypt. The wine portions were added later and the wine portion uh, represented the new land, the promised land, the land of milk and honey, the land of abundance. Wine was always associated with abundance. Okay, so the wine portion was added later on. Um, and of course, in between the food, they would offer a prayer, and, you know, and then they would eat some more and offer another prayer and, you know, and, and quote another uh, piece of scripture. So at the point, and, and there were four cups, you know, it had gotten to the point, there were four cups, I, I don't mean four individual cups, but four servings of wine. So they'd eat and they'd eat, and then they'd offer a blessing, or not a toast, that's, that's too worldly, but they'd offer a blessing and then they'd take some of the wine, go back, eat some more food, another blessing, you know, more wine, so on and so forth. So now, at this point, there's only some bread left and one last portion of wine. And it's at this point that Jesus changes the significance of the meal and the significance of the elements. The wine, you know, uh, we'll start with the bread. The bread no longer represents their haste to leave Egypt, but now will represent His body, which will endure the cross. The wine will no longer represent the blessings of the promised land, but will now represent His blood or His life, because life is in the blood, right, which will be sacrificed for the sins of mankind. So Jesus, after once again speaking of His death, tells them He will drink wine with them again when the kingdom, the church, will be established and they will share this supper once again. So this prophecy is fulfilled every time the church gathers to share communion in remembrance of Christ. Why? Because whenever two or more are gathered in my name, where am I? Uh, I'm there, he says. So when we gather in the name of Jesus to share the communion, his promise is that he's with us sharing that communion uh, as well. Now, the custom of the Passover was to sing a Hallel, all right? Uh, the Hallel, the songs, were a series of psalms, actually, that we know. Psalm 115, 116, 117, 118, that was the Hallel. And so they finished by singing. You know, I, I often wonder, you know, not wonder, but I often reflect on the idea that we sing. You know, in the Churches of Christ, we're an a cappella you know, church. We sing, you know, and the Lord sang. The Lord, you know, think about it, He sang. There was music and He followed the music. He sang the words, you know. We do the same thing. We, he sang, we sing. You know, I think there's a beautiful symmetry there, a beautiful balance that we, that we see. And after they've sung these songs, they go to the Mount of Olives, which was a public park actually used for a quiet meditation. And from the Mount of Olives, you can actually see Jerusalem, you know, it's up here on a hill, you're on this side here, and then there's the valley here between, and then Jerusalem is on this hill, it's about a mile, and you can see clearly, you can see the city, the walls, the gates, everything, from the, the, the Mount of, of Olives, and it's still there, the, 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 it's the, not the Mount of Olives, but the Garden of Gethsemane, rather, um, is still there. Uh, I mean, not the original trees, you know, olive trees, you know, they, don't, they don't last 2,000 years. You know. 
uh, but the, the space is there and the road is still there. It's the same road. You know, it's paved now, but it's the same road and it leads to Bethany. You know? So uh, they go there. Uh, verse 27, and Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because it is written, I will strike down the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, even though all may fall away, yet I will not. And Jesus said to him, truly I say to you that this very night before a rooster crows twice, you yourself will deny me three times. But Peter kept saying insistently, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And they all were saying the same thing also. Notice they were all saying the same thing. I mean, we're hard on Peter, right? We're hard on Peter. But they were all saying the same thing. And they all ran away. And notice only Peter followed to go to the courtyard. <laughs> the others, they, they didn't even get close to the, court, to the courtyard. And so uh, Peter insists uh, that he will not deny Jesus. Jesus tells him that he, that he will. And um, uh, of course, we know the rest of that story. All right, just a few minutes. I'm almost done here. So the Mount of Olives was called so because of the grove of olive trees on its slope. And as I say, Gethsemane means Actually, the term Gethsemane means an oil press. Okay? Uh, and so this was the site where, where, where the, there was a, 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 um, a press uh, situated. And it's interesting that the apostles slept during Jesus' period of agony, as well as the period of glory at the transfiguration. You know, they're always sleeping, these guys, at the, at the, at the wrong uh, moment. So Jesus accepts the suffering that his human nature was trying to avoid naturally. It wouldn't have been natural if he would have said, Lord, I am so looking forward to getting this cross thing over with, you know, I mean, just a couple of more hours to go. No, his flesh, like our flesh, says, I don't want to do this, it's going to hurt. You know? And uh, so Mark talks about that, actually devotes a certain uh, you know, good amount of time. Uh, we won't read that, don't have the time to, to do that. Uh, Judas, we know that Judas uh, leads a mob of temple guards and rabble-rousers and he arrests Jesus after uh, having identified him with a kiss. And uh, Mark says that one of Jesus' apostles, John tells us it's Peter, uh, cuts the ear off of uh, one of the priest's service, uh, servants, even gives the name of that fellow, Malchus. Okay? And Luke tells us that Jesus healed that, that servant. And so Mark mentions also that there was a young man who was there in the garden who ran away, leaving only his clothes behind. And scholars uh, believe that he was actually referring to himself because Mark actually lived in Jerusalem. All right. So 53, uh, let's finish off here. It says, they led Jesus away to the high priest and all the chief priests and the elders and the scribes gathered together. Peter had followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest, and he was sitting with the officers and warming himself at the fire. Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain testimony against Jesus to put him to death, and they were not finding any. For many were giving false testimony against him, but their testimony was not consistent. Some stood up and began to give false testimony against him, saying, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another made without hands. Not even in this respect was their testimony consistent. Uh, the high priest uh, stood up and came forward and questioned Jesus, saying, do you not answer? What is it that these men are testifying against you? But he kept silent and did not answer. Again, the high priest was questioning him and saying to him, are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. Tearing his clothes, the high priest said, what further uh, need do we have of witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. How does it seem to you? And they all condemned him to be deserving of death. Some began to spit at him and to blindfold him and to beat him with their fists and to say to him, prophecy. And the officers received him with slaps in the face. So the problem for the high priest and the Sanhedrin was to formulate a serious enough charge against Jesus to warrant the death penalty. They wanted to kill him themselves, but they couldn't because the Romans, only the Romans could authorize an execution. So they finally make a charge, blasphemy, which according to Jewish law is punishable by death, but not according to Roman law. Blasphemy is not you know, a death penalty thing for the Romans. 
Note that they have nothing to accuse him with until Jesus himself acknowledges the truth. He cannot deny his own self. Note also that they had no legal reason to put him to death, but used a political and mob pressure to do so. Let me just finish this last passage here. It says, as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came and seeing Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with Jesus the Nazarene. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're talking about. And he went out onto the porch. The servant girl saw him and began once more to say to the bystanders, this is one of them. But again he denied it, and after a little while the bystanders were again saying to Peter, surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean too. But he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man that you were talking about. Immediately a rooster crowed a second time, and Peter remembered how Jesus had made the remark to him, before a rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he began to weep. Amazing thing, he was swearing and cursing. Swearing and cursing to, to convince the people, this is how much I do not want you to associate me with him. I can understand why he was weeping. So Peter's in the courtyard of the high priest, which would be the front yard. He's with another disciple who was known by the high priest's people. Um, when confronted by the servants and the others about his association with Jesus, he not only denies it, as I say, he curses and swears that he doesn't even know the man. Perhaps Peter followed to see if Jesus would do a miracle. Maybe that's why he followed. You know, a little like Samson, you know, bust open the thing, break the chains, take over, do a great miracle, kill all the soldiers. You know. He wanted to be there to see that happen. But when he saw that Jesus was tried and tortured, just like any ordinary man, he became afraid. And you know, people do awful things when they're under the pressure, when they're under pressure or they're under afraid. And of course, Peter fell victim to this weak and sinful nature. So as the cock crows and Friday is dawning, Peter realizes what he has done and is immediately sorrow, true sorrow, tears of sorrow. He had done something he could not take back. He had done something he could not fix. He couldn't pay for it. Only Jesus could make it right, and of course we know that He did. All right, next week we're going to wrap it up, the crucifixion and resurrection from Mark's perspective. Thank you for your kind and loving attention. <laughs>